All right, welcome everybody. I think we'll, we might get um, some more folks, but we, I think we've got a decent critical mass and lots to cover today. So we wanna go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Jillian Morchetti. Um, I work for Homebase, we're a nonprofit. Hope some of you, some of you know us, some of you may not. We're a nonprofit that focuses on homelessness. We've been um, doing this work, helping to build community capacity and generally support efforts to reduce and end homelessness for over 30 years. We focus a lot in California, but also work across the country. And we also have specifically focused a lot over the last several years on um, the intersection of homelessness and healthcare and ways to support communities, um, health systems and homeless response systems work together, collaborate, partner, coordinate um, to better serve folks who are experiencing homelessness and have healthcare needs. So we've been really excited with all of the new resources and new opportunities that have been coming out, especially across the state over the last um, year or more, focusing on um, ways to improve healthcare and additional resources. Obviously the state has been focused on this for the past several years, but more recently, lots and lots of new resources and there's lots of information flying around we know. And so we're really excited uh, with the support of the California Healthcare Foundation to be putting on this webinar. And we've got some uh, materials we put together as well that we can share at the end. Um, but again, no, there's lots going on. People are extremely busy this time of year and we're really happy that you all had some time to take to spend with us to go over the basics of CalAIM, which is a California Medi-Cal program and especially the new Housing and Homelessness Incentive Program which we're gonna be focusing on primarily today to talk about some of the opportunities to leverage this new program and the funding that comes along with it and the really great opportunities to partner with the health system and specifically managed care plans. So I'm here with my coworkers, um, Julie Silas and Frankie Perkins. So you'll be hearing from both of them later. Um, and I'm gonna just take a moment to provide an overview of what we'll be covering today before we get started. If you have, uh, let me just note actually before we do that, we have both a chat available and a Q&A box. So you're definitely encouraged in the chat, introduce yourselves to each other throughout. We'll be talking about lots of different um, content. And so you're welcome to share your responses to it, talk to each other about ideas, um, things you wanna share with folks. If you have questions for any of us, um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And so you can use the Q&A box to make sure we don't miss that in case the chat gets busy. So if you do have questions, if you're having issues, you know. Um, with anything or you know, need to clarify something or have a question for the end, just make sure you pop that in the Q&A box. And if you're having any tech issues or anything, give a shout in the chat for the Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna provide a quick overview of what we're gonna cover today. We have, um, we have an hour, so we're gonna first start with just for context purposes, an overview, a very brief overview of CalAIM and particularly it's new housing related services, which um, some folks may have more or less familiarity with, but enhanced care management or ECM you might hear it referred to, and also community supports. Um, we're also going to provide an overview of the new housing and homelessness incentive program or HIP. That is gonna be the, real, the main focus of our presentation today. And specifically, we're gonna talk through some opportunities to leverage HIP funds and partner opportunities with Medi-Cal managed care plans in your community. And then, like I said, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So, um, there'll be time for you to put questions in at the end, but obviously as questions come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to put those in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can throughout. We'll also be sending around the recording of this webinar um, and the slides after the fact. And as a reminder for, hopefully you know that, you know this if you've signed up for this webinar, but we also have two different office hours opportunities for additional questions and discussions to go through um, this content. So if you're interested in that, we'll. If you haven't already signed up, we'll provide the link at the end too to make sure folks have are aware of those opportunities and can join. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Julie to get us started to talk through the, um, oh, to give us an overview of Calium and some of the housing related services. Of course, the uh, trash pickup is right in front of my house as you pass the baton, <laughs> Julian. But Well, we, we can't hear it. We're okay, good, thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, CalAIM's housing-related services. Uh, as Jillian said, we'll go to the next slide. Um, there are two. So CalAIM is uh, short for California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal, and it's a new Medi-Cal initiative um, with a focus on improving health of all Californians, especially with those with complex needs. So thinking about those of you who might have been familiar with the work that um, we did in the state on whole person care, the idea is that through that experience, California learned that coordinating care and collaborating across multiple systems um, is really um, 
helps make sure that people with complex healthcare needs have their needs met and they can be healthier and stable. Um, and so based on all those amazing experiences, the state um, got approval from the federal government to do this new initiative. And they're focusing on a number of different vulnerable populations, one of which is people experiencing um, or at risk of homelessness who have behavior health um, or physical health conditions. So um, for folks who aren't familiar with how Medi-Cal works, and I apologize in advance, I sometimes mix up saying Medicaid and Medi-Cal. And just for clarity, Medicaid is the federal program and we call it in California Medi-Cal. So when I say Medicaid or Medi-Cal, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so the way that it works in California is that California contracts with uh, Medi-Cal managed care plans and they then contract with provider networks to deliver services to Medi-Cal members. Um, some of the Medi-Cal managed care plans are statewide plans that work across many, many counties. And then there are others that are might be created. They're called local health plans that are specific to one, one county, maybe two counties. Um, so what happens is each Medi-Cal member selects their managed care plan, and that managed care plan is responsible for providing health coverage to their members and only their members. Um, the managed care plans receive per member per month payments for the number for each of the um, enrollees that sign up. Um, and that includes providing them the range of traditional Medicaid, Medi-Cal services, and in addition to some of these new services under CalAIM. And as I said before, if you're working in a county, um, you may have one managed care plan that provides Medicaid to your um, community. You might have two, you might have three. You might work with a managed care plan that works in five, six, seven different counties. So that's sort of how the structure works. So next slide. <clears throat> so through the CalAIM initiative, there are two specific programs that we're not going to focus on today, but we want to provide a little context. So it, they it, they sort of are services that are in that are covered under Medi-Cal. Um, and one of them is called Enhanced Care Management, also referenced as ECM, and that's what you hear a lot, ECM, ECM, and then Community Supports. And they offer housing-related services for people experiencing or at risk of homelessness, as well as other vulnerable populations. The Enhanced Care Management Program is a program that's been embedded into the entire Medi-Cal program in California. So all Medicare managed care, Medi-Cal managed care plans are offering enhanced care management to their eligible members. The community supports are new services that Medi-Cal managed care plans can opt to offer. There is a series of 14 of them, which we'll show you in a minute. And Medi-Cal plans can choose to offer one or more of them. They also have the option to start out offering a few and then incorporate more as time goes on. The idea in both of these programs is really to allow people to access services in a more comprehensive way, in a whole person way, so that not only are there housing and their healthcare needs being met, but recognizing that housing is healthcare and that getting people stable housing and making sure people have a roof over the head actually has the ability to improve people's health outcomes. So it, with that in mind, we'll go a little bit into each of these. So enhanced care management is for Medi-Cal members with complex care needs. Um, and it's intensive care, care coordination across multiple systems, including the homeless system of care, health care, um, different health care facilities. Um, and the idea here is that um, providers have to meet their Medi-Cal members where they are. And when you think about um, people experiencing homelessness, it's really difficult sometimes if they have health care needs to get from the shelter or if they're in an encampment to a doctor's office, they may not have resource for transportation, they um, may not be able to have access to um, those kind of services. So the idea is that doctors and other medical professionals um, can actually provide their services at shelters and encampments and people's homes and still get reimbursed um, through their managed care, Medi-Cal managed care plan. The heart 
um, enhanced care management is really the care management piece. And so it's, it's enhanced in the sense that there are case managers, um, care managers who work directly with the Medi-Cal members, they help them set up goals, they make sure they receive their vast array of benefits that they're eligible for, and they manage that cross-system coordination so that's not on the person experiencing homelessness, um, and they coordinate to make sure that members are able to achieve the goals they set out. So the referral and the um, higher degree of care management is what is part of what's being funded through the ECM benefit. The other really important thing about this benefit is that um, the referral system is broader than what you normally think of as the primary care physician referring someone to services. This is a referral that homeless system providers can um, refer. If you're in a shelter and you see someone and you know they have Medi-Cal, you can refer them to this. They can self-refer, their family or community members can refer them. Um, and then the Medi-Cal managed care plan will determine whether they meet the criteria for, for enhanced care management and start helping them get the services that they need. So that's unique and special and, and important for you all in terms of that collaboration um, between county, the COCs, and the Medi-Cal plans um, to be able to enhance that, that coordination. And this allows for a lot of flexibility for that. Next slide. Um, community supports is um, the, pro the program that I talked about where this is optional for Medi-Cal managed care plans. And basically what, they, what the state did, DHCS did, was they identified 14 pre-identified services that managed care plans can choose to incorporate into the services that they offer to their members. Um, our understanding is that um, almost all, if not all, the managed care plans are offering at least one of these services. And the idea is you can see here that they are not the kind of traditional services that Medicaid normally pays. When you think of health insurance, you don't think they're going to pay a housing deposit or they're going to pay for housing navigator services. Um, but that is what the intention of the community supports um, are, is to allow Medicaid dollars to be used to be able to support um, people in terms of their health by providing them more access to stable housing and stable serv uh, housing services. So what, how this works is that the Medi-Cal plans chose which services that they wanted to include, and each Medi-Cal plan has different set of services that they're covering under community supports. And they might have identified a few to start out. So let's say a plan said, we're gonna help with housing deposits, we're gonna add more coverage for personal care and homemaker services, um, and we're gonna pay for one housing navigator to help our members access housing services. And then after they've successfully done that, they've seen, wow, this is really helpful. Um, our members are coming to the doctor appointments more readily, they're taking their medications more often. Um, over time, they can add more. So maybe they want to add some recuperative care for people transitioning from an institution um, and making sure that they can stabilize so that they don't end up homeless. Um, they may decide to cover recuperative care, or maybe they decide, wow, let's do medically supportive food. So they're not, even though they may not be covering all the 14 services now, over time, they can add more and more of those services. And that's really important. And similarly, these, uh, these are voluntary services for the Medi-Cal member. They don't have to accept any of these services if they don't want them. And um, again, self-referral, You can someone can say, I'm interested in community supports. I think I'm eligible. A community member can, a shelter provider can, street outreach worker can. So those are all really important um, uh, benefits. Next slide. Julie, before we move on, I just wanted because yeah. we've gotten a couple questions about this, so just wanted to note um, in terms of the how how you make referrals and how someone could self refer themselves. First of all, it will be different for ECM and community supports, um, and also most plans have a slightly different form or process. Um, and if it's 
you know, plans that operate across counties, they might have the same one in different counties. But honestly, the best way to figure out how the plans in your local community are doing this in terms of actually um, accepting referrals, what the forms are, what the processes are, what documentation needs to be included, all of that stuff, um, is to reach out directly to the plans in your community. And your COC might have some, some, um, some communication with them already. Some counties have CalAIM roundtables operating where the plans, if there are multiple, are working together. So I put in one of the um, answers and we can put it in the chat as well, the directory to find out which plans are operating, but that's really unfortunately the best way is um, there's no simple answer I wish there were for everything. Um, so reaching out to find out how they're doing it and also there could be some opportunities to work with them to kind of streamline some of those processes for folks experiencing homelessness if that's not already happening. So sorry to interrupt Julie, I just wanted to yeah, no, uh, mention that because we're getting multiple questions about it. Yeah. And that's also a way once you identify who they are to reach out to them and find out what are the community supports that you're offering in our county. Great, thank you, Jillian. So the focus today um, is a little bit of a different program through CalAIM. It's called the Housing and Homelessness Incentive Program. And it's not increased services or new services added to Medi-Cal, it's really a different program. So we wanted to highlight it and help make sure it really clear people understand um, what the program is and the potential for um, really leveraging new resources into your communities to address homeless, the intersection of homelessness and healthcare. So we'll go ahead to the first slide. So um, the Housing and Homelessness Incentive Program, people call it HIP. Um, it's a special program under CalAIM, um, and it's $1.3 billion in one-time American Rescue Plan Act funding, ARPA funding. And um, under HIP, it's Medi-Cal plans can earn incentive funds by making investments and progress in addressing homelessness in their communities, in their local communities. It's a voluntary program. And what is required is that they have to collaborate and work at a county level with the local community, including counties and continuums of care, to help improve health outcomes and access to health and housing services for their members um, to be able to address housing insecurity and housing instability. Next slide. What does that mean? <laughs> So the stated goals for the program are to ensure that the managed care plans are actually collaborating and partnering with their homeless systems of care. Um, what we know about and what we've learned with whole person care as well as Medi-Cal in general is that oftentimes, especially people with complex care needs, they're touching lots of different systems. They're having to tell people the same information. They're having to coordinate that care um, on their own. And for people with complex needs, that's really difficult. And so recognizing that sometimes there are great deep partnerships between the continuums of care and homeless systems and their local um, hospitals and their local community clinics, there might not be that level of integration with the managed care plans. And so this incentive program is to incentivize deeper partnerships between the Medi-Cal managed care plans and the homeless systems of care with the goal, second stated and more important goal is reducing and preventing homelessness. So the idea is by bringing that collaboration together and incentivizing that collaboration and working better together that together they will be able to reduce and prevent homelessness. The populations that are covered in terms of being able to benefit from these programs are individuals experiencing or at risk of homelessness, both by the traditional HUD definition, but it also includes people who are doubled up or couch surfing, couch surfing so a little bit broader than um, sometimes we get in the HUD funded programs. Next slide. So it's geographically based. Um, and so um, each county has um, a set of managed care plans that work in that county. Maybe it's one managed care plan, maybe it's two, maybe it's three, maybe it's more. And they are supposed to coordinate and collaborate together to develop a local homeless plan that the managed care plans are engaged in um, for that particular county. Um, and then many of them are collaborating on their investment plans, which we'll talk a little about later, which is more specifically focused on implementation. 
Um, the idea here is to collaborate with the local homeless system of care, the county, um, and the COC, and invest funds and resources um, that are more than what the traditional Medicaid pays for, meaning per member per month. So thinking more strategically, innov innovatively, big picture thinking about how are the systems on the ground working and how can we invest in the systems um, and the solutions to preventing and ending homelessness that don't get re responded to in the same way through the Medicaid services, even the ECM and um, community support services. So that's the intention. We'll talk a little bit about how that works in the next slide. So what happened is California predetermined by each county the maximum amount of incentive funds from that 1.3 billion that each county set of Medi-Cal managed care plans was eligible for. So each Medi-Cal managed care plan knows that they may have an innovation incentive fund for this specific county for this amount of money. Um, and they earn that money over the course of the program. The program is um, through ARPA, so it's over in March, 2024. And the vast majority of funds that um, can be drawn down through the incentive funds are available in May 2023 and March 2024. It doesn't guarantee money. Um, they are incentive funds. They are allocated to each managed care plan for each county, but it does not mean that they will automatically get those funds. The whole point of the program is, is for the managed care plans to collaborate with their counties and their COCs to do work in order to show that they are collaborating and they are investing in and, and committing resources into preventing and ending homelessness. And the more the ability they show that, the more access to those incentive funds they'll be able to draw down. Um, so. Um, the idea is that the incentive funds themselves, so it's it's hard for people to understand. It's not a grant fund. It's not like we're going to grant you this much money and we're committing to this much money to invest in the community. The idea is that managed care plans invest in the community. And when they invest in that community, they do it in a way that shows that they're collaborating and they're meeting a set of metrics, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then that will bring more money into the managed care plans to invest more money into the community. Um, the money that the plans pull down from these incentive funds, um, Health, Department of Healthcare Services won't direct or restrict the way they use those funds, except they've messaged very clearly that they intend those funds to be used to bolster housing and homelessness focused efforts to be able to achieve progress in reducing and ending homelessness. And they expect that the managed care plans will make maximize the investments with local partners who actually are on the ground doing this work day to day with people experiencing homelessness. So that's the idea of that. Next slide. So let's talk about how um, the managed care plans have to perform in order to be able to access the in incentive funds. So the first is they had to send a letter of intent to the Department of Healthcare Services to say, we're interested in participating in the program. No funding was um, associated with that, just the idea that the department knew, you know, which managed care plans are gonna do this with us. Then in June 30, 2022, a couple months ago, they had to submit collaboratively all the managed care plans for that county, had to come up with one local homeless plan and submit that to the state. And they had to provide um, some harmony with whatever the county and COC was planning on doing around their HAP3 program. After the state received that, the state asked for in, an investment plan from the managed care plans. And that is due at the end of this month. And that is really the reason why we pulled this together in the middle of NOFO, in the middle while everybody stretched already really thin, because we want, this is an important opportunity that we wanted to make sure people had sufficient information to be able to engage um, with the managed care plans um, to 
raise their voice and, and make sure those investment plans meet the needs of what's going on at the local level. So those investment plans have to be in by the end of this month, but they're just an investment plan. It's saying to the state, hey, this is what we're thinking about how we're gonna invest our money. It's not real commitments. Um, those will be contracted and decided as, as um, the managed care plans build those relationships with the local providers um, and um, invest, you know, decide how those investments are made. Um, the last two areas are two measurement periods. So the state is going to look at how the performance has gone um, in terms of the partnerships and the work to reduce and end homelessness between May and the end of this year. And that report will be due in February and any funds allocated based on those that performance will be available starting May 2023. And then the second measurement period covers the beginning of the year 2023 through October. Um, and that report is due to the state at the end of December of next year. And then those additional funds up to 50% of the remaining of the allocation um, will be available to be drawn down by the managed care plans in March. Next slide. So let's just talk a little bit more detail about what that means. So let's say there's $100 that they're eligible for. That's the amount of money the state said of the $1.3 billion. This managed care plan for the county of Joseph um, is eligible for $100. So um, if they file their local health plan, homeless plan, and the state said, great, we like this plan, they'll give them $5, 5% of that or up to $5. They love it. They think it's good, but it's not good enough. We'll give you $4 of the $5 you're eligible for. Then they file the investment plan. The state looks at that. Any negotiations that have to happen, um, they're eligible for another $10, 10% of that hundred. So up to 10 more dollars. And they can then reinvest when those monies come through back into the community to do what they can with that $15. Then uh, after that first measurement period, um, well, they look at how much of the metrics have they met as a community, how are things improving, how much progress has been made. Um, they're eligible for up to another 35%. And so in May of 2023, they may get another $35 to invest in this community. And then they keep on doing the work, they're spending all this time, they're continuing to collaborate, and then at the end of the period, when they file in December, 2023, the state looks and is like, wow, you all have just knocked it out of the ballpark. They'll give them the extra $50 that they had, or maybe a little less because they got to third base, but not a home run. So that's the idea. Um, again, all of them are up to, so they're, they're not going to get more than 5%. When uh, based on the local homeless plan, they're not going to get more than another 10% for the investment plan, um, but they may get less. The actual amounts really depend on how the managed care plan is able to meet a set of 15 metrics that the state identified. Um, and it's very possible that they won't be able to pull down their full um, incentive fund allocation um, ever or at the first measurement period, but maybe by the second measurement period. So again, this is all something that will happen gradually over time, depending on how well those partnerships are going, how much improvement they can show in terms of meeting these metrics. And the important part is, is that the greater the collaboration is, the better in sync the homeless system of care is with the managed care plans, the more likely they are gonna be able to maximize the incentive funds that they'll be able to draw down. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. And then I'm gonna hand it back to Jillian so that she gets a chance to really dig in a little bit more on the details on the metrics. And Jillian, um, this might be a time if there are any additional questions that we want to clarify that you've seen come up. Um, no, I, I think I've been answering them in the, I've been answering a lot of them in writing. So if y'all have not submitted questions, we are curious to see what questions folks have been, have been asking um, to answer 
you can open the Q&A pod and look in the under answered um, to read through those. And we can we can always like highlight some of those if we have time for the end. Um, so thanks very much, Julie. So I'm gonna, as Julie said, I'm gonna cover real quickly the um, investment plan, which is a big piece of why we scheduled this webinar so quickly to happen now, um, even though many of you on the COC side are working on your NOFA applications and those are due at the end of this month. Um, so Julie mentioned the investment plan, right? This is one of the requirements for MCPs to get their funding and it's how they can get up to 10% of their allocation. These are due at the end of September on September 30th. And so hopefully if you're at the county or the COC or elsewhere in the homeless response system, you might have been talking in some way with your local managed care plans about this investment plan. Um, it basically requires each health plan to demonstrate that they have a roadmap, they have clear ideas for how they're going to actually achieve the H hit metrics um, and also how they're gonna kind of um, collaborate with their local partners to do that, what activities they're gonna do. So it's not one thing that can be a little confusing. Um, and I think even the plans we're necessarily expecting is when the state provided this template for an investment plan, um, it's, not, it's not requiring managed care plans to say how they're going to spend their incentive funds if and when they get them. It's how it's more um, specifically how they're going to invest and what they're going to focus on in order to make sure they hit the metrics that will then allow them to draw down those funds. So we just wanted to really clarify that because when you hear investment plan and you know HIP is a bunch of funding, potentially it's very easy to assume that this plan is for how they're going to spend all these incentive dollars and that's actually not what it is. So um, plans in order to, to submit this investment plan, they have to, each plan has to identify the activities they're going to fund the, and the work they're going to do, um, what the time frame is for doing that work, what gaps they're addressing by doing that work, and then um, the amount of funding, the amount they're going to spend um, to do that work, who's going to receive that funding. So it might be, um, you know, they're internally spending and it might be their funding, you know, organizations in the community to do work. And then also most, you know, more importantly, um, what metrics they're planning to impact by each of these work. So the, the state wants to see, and I, they're required to at least show that they're impacting um, at least 10 of the metrics as they're putting their investment plan together. So the state wants to see they have a plan for actually meeting the metrics. Um, and um, health plans have to collaborate with their local COCs in developing their investment plans. Um, each COC, each um, plan is required to submit a letter of support from their local COC when they're submitting their investment plan. So if you haven't been, if you're on the COC side and you haven't been in touch with your health plans, um, you're almost certainly, or someone at the COC who has the authority to sign those kinds of letters will be um, reached out to. So that's part of why we wanted to talk before the 30th, obviously. So there's um, some information you all have to inform the investment plan. So Julie talked about, we've been talking about metrics a bit. So we actually wanna go through the details of the metrics. So um, Department of Healthcare Services is evaluating the plans on 15 specific metrics um, to determine how effective their engagement with the local homeless system is and how um, impactful their investments have been in actually addressing people's homelessness and housing insecurity. So these metrics, again, as we've said, but we're gonna keep repeating because it's really important to the health plans because of this. Um, and also, so we wanna make sure you all are like fully aware of what the, what the metrics are and why they're so important, why they're such a priority um, or a focus on them. So the metrics will determine, as Julie said, how much of the incentive funds each health plan will ultimately actually receive. And the state has organized them into these three priority areas. So it's looking at partnering and building capacity to support referrals for services, on um, building or improving infrastructure to help coordinate and actually meet members' housing needs. And by member, we mean Medi-Cal members, so the managed care plans members, and then actually um, looking at the delivery of services and member engagement. So there are 15 metrics and the next three slides list them all out and um, you'll again we'll send these slides out so you'll have them. But there are seven in particular of those 15 that the state has that DHCS has identified as what they call high priority metrics. Um, and we've marked them in red just so they're easy to see, but essentially all the metrics matter all the metrics matter in terms of how much funding the MCPs get but these seven priority metrics, um, if they're well performed can earn MCPs extra points. So for example, if they're not doing as well on some of the other metrics, but are doing better on some of the priorities, um, they may get, you know, kind of make up some of the points they didn't get on the, the other metrics. So each of the next slides, lots of lots of text on here. I'm not gonna read through all of them. We'll, we'll send the slides out, but I wanted to at least give everyone a sense of what the metrics were, partially so that you have this information to help inform your conversations with managed care plans. Um, and also, so you have a good sense of, when, when plans are focusing so much on metrics, wanting to really like make sure you all are aware that 
each of these metrics is, you know, the state has said, we want you to hit these metrics. And so that's why managed care plans are trying to do it. But ultimately all of these things are things that folks that are working on the response to homelessness want to do anything anyway. These are all things that will better serve folks experiencing ho homelessness and housing instability. They're all sort of our collective goals in general. So we wanted to make sure you all are aware of what they all are. So this first priority area, there are seven metrics here, two of which are those high priorities. So I'll just start with those. The state is really trying to incentivize um, via these metrics, health plans connecting with and really integrating with their local COC's coordinated entry system. So that's one high priority. And then also um, looking at partnerships, wanting to, again, this is all about you know, incentivizing collaboration and partnerships to better serve folks experiencing homelessness and to you know, improve the overall response to homelessness. So this metric is partnering with counties, COCs, and um, organizations that actually deliver housing services um, with which the health plans have some sort of data sharing agreement that allows for the exchange of information and matching membership, right? So in service of actually identifying um, folks and making sure they're connected to the different things. So some of the other metrics here are making sure that health plans are engaging with the local COC in various different ways. There's some examples there. Um, the health plans identifying and addressing barriers that are in the way of their uh, members and folks experiencing homelessness to actually accessing medically appropriate and cost-effective um, community supports. So again, you'll see community supports and ECM reference throughout here, which is a big part of why we wanted to make sure to do a little primer on those as part of this presentation. Um, if applicable, they also want to see if there's a um, data sharing agreement with county mental health plans and also um, drug medical organization delivery system. So that's that's kind of a if that is applicable in your community. And then the last two are um, partnerships and strategies that the health plan will develop to address um, to further equity and address disparities um, in the delivery of housing and um, services. And then finally, lessons that they're learning that they're learning from developing and implementing the investment plan that they're working on now. So that's the first sort of priority area of metrics. The second one is only three metrics, and two of those are high priority according to the state. So that's um, connecting with street medicine teams if those exist, or you know, creating could be creating street medicine um, teams if they don't exist to make sure that folks who are experiencing homelessness are connected to healthcare where they're at. Um, so that's a high priority one. I know a lot of communities we've been working with are focused on this, among other things, making sure that the health plan is connected with the local HMIS. And one of the earlier metrics of that is just, you know, do the health plans have access to HMIS? That's one check mark. And then there's some other additional kind of functionality and features that are being requested of the states of the, excuse me, of the plans later on. And then this last metric in this priority area is um, does the health plan have a process to actually track and manage referrals to those to these housing related community supports? Um, so making sure that folks are connected to these and also that the health plan is aware of, you know, how many people are actually being connected to the housing related supports. Um, and these are some of those here listed out among those 14 that are that are possible. And then finally, the Priority area three has three high priority metrics, but all of them are um, related to actually write the service delivery or actually providing services to members experiencing homelessness. So these first two look at the number of or the percentage of the health plans members who are um, actually screened to find out whether they're homeless, experiencing homelessness or at risk. Um, and so this first one is just looking at the state is wanting to see an increase and the percentage of health, each health plans members that are screened for homelessness, because, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, many health plans aren't aware of who of their members are experiencing homelessness, and obviously that's a critical step in making sure folks are connected to the services they need. And then that second one looks at a specific subset of members, so folks who are, <clears throat> excuse me, who are being discharged from inpatient medical settings or have been in the emergency department, you know, a certain number of times within a span. So folks who are accessing emergency care more often, um, DHCS is wanting to specifically see the number of members who are within that category, who are like making sure that health plans are particularly paying attention to screening those folks for homelessness. And then 3.3 um, 3 and 3.4 are looking at the number of members who are actually connected to those programs we were talking about earlier that Julie covered, who is being successfully engaged with enhanced care management, and the number of members wanting to see an increase in the number of members 
who are actually getting at least one housing related community support, right? So that list on the slide before. And then these last two, hopefully everyone is glad to see that this is a high priority for the state, but wanting to actually, you know, the managed care plans are gonna to have to report on the number of their members who were successfully housed. So folks experiencing homelessness that were successfully housed, and then also folks who remained successfully housed. So looking at both ending homelessness and preventing it. So I know that's a, a lot of metrics to kind of keep track of, but we wanted to just make sure given the focus on metrics that you all were aware of what they were. And when health plans are saying, we have to meet these metrics, like these are what they're talking about. And there's of course details like, you know, what, what percentage increase does the state wanna see? And those, you know, will affect how much funding plans get if they're making progress, but not quite enough. As Julie said, it kind of depends on the progress each plan makes, the amount that the state ultimately ends up releasing. Uh, but we wanted to make sure at least folks are aware of like what these metrics are, and especially which ones are the very high priority ones that the plans are particularly focused on figuring out how to meet. So all of that said, um, we've provided a lot of information already. We don't, we have um, a bit more time and we really wanna focus in on how US COCs or counties or other folks who are on the homeless response system can partner with and work with and kind of think through ways to really leverage the opportunities that HF creates, not just the funding, which is obviously a huge part of it, but just like the incentive for getting more cross system collaboration going and to specifically work with the health plans to meet all these metrics, um, not just because that maximizes the opportunity for money to come in to the community through the managed care plans, um, but also because again, working towards all these metrics that we've laid out will positively impact the folks experiencing homelessness in your community and will hopefully um, make your work be able to kind of improve the work that you all are doing on the homeless response side um, and helps fill some of the gaps that you all have been seeing, you know, as you've been do doing your work over the years. So um, just kind of, again, sort of a why, why we're talking about collaboration so much in this context, in addition to what we've already covered, is, you know, we, the people that are experiencing homelessness in this state, unlike some states luckily are eligible for, and many are hopefully already enrolled in Medi-Cal managed care, but despite that, historically, health plans have not been, you know, this varies across community, obviously, but have not been um, engaged specifically in efforts to address homelessness necessarily. And so this obviously, this opportunity, uh, this program, as we've talked about, really offers, really incentivizes this kind of building of relationships and partnerships for the first time in a, um, in a, in a very concrete way, right? So we know that through CalAIM and including, you know, the ECM and community supports programs that Julie covered earlier and, and some other opportunities over the past few years, um, MCPs have been funding some homeless services for their members. But again, even so, while that's great and good progress, it doesn't necessarily mean that health plans are connected fully or really fully educated or understand um, the larger homeless system of care in their community, how it operates, how they can connect to it, how you know partnerships can really benefit both sides and the folks that you all are both serving. So this is, you know, so HIP is really an opportunity for health plans to better understand the homeless system of care, just as it is for you all in the COC and the county and the homeless response side to better understand the role that health plans can play um, and how these programs we've been talking about and especially HIP can really support your already ongoing efforts to address homelessness and kind of fill some gaps and expand and improve the existing efforts. So these next few slides and um, the resources that we'll share after that we're gonna kind of introduce you to via these slides but are much too much content to cover in a, a webinar. Um, the purpose of these and why we're all here together today to talk about this is to make sure that folks are aware of, you can kind of answer this question of how counties and COCs and your partners can work with the managed care plans to meet their metrics um, so that they can receive the maximum amount of incentive plans or uh, funds possible. Um, and also, for the purpose of kind of filling these gaps that are really critical to your local homeless response efforts. So all of this is in service of not just meeting the metrics or not, not for meeting the metrics for metrics sake, right? Although they are good things to progress towards, um, but to maximize the funding that can come into the community and kind of help fill some of these gaps. So what we have done is identified these five key activity or investment opportunity areas that were COCs and your local COCs and counties and other stakeholders on the homeless response side can work with their um, 
health plans on to discuss and strategize around and really kind of identify some key activities and work that can be done. And all of, and all of the specific ideas we have under each of these activities all have the potential to impact those high priority and in fact, all the HIP metrics. So we've broken it up into these five areas and the next few slides will um, I'll share how you can kind of dig down into each of those a bit. So um, those areas are improving and expanding upon methods that you're using to actually identify folks experiencing homelessness and then outreach and engage with folks um, and assess what their needs are and their strengths and what resources um, available resources would be great to connect them with. The second one is um, looking at kind of prevention and diversion, right? So preventing folks from experiencing homelessness or becoming homeless um, and also rapidly resolving people's homelessness. Expanding housing opportunities. I know that's a huge one everywhere and especially in a lot of communities in California, there's, we know there's never enough um, housing available. And so there's some, an area of actually leveraging HIP in this opportunity to help expand the opportunities available for folks. Um, connecting people who are experiencing a risk of homelessness to healthcare and to other community resources that can contribute to housing stability, right? So all the different kinds of um, housing related supports and supportive services that we're all um, familiar with. And then the final area here we have is um, relating to infrastructure and system improvements, right? So looking at things like expanding or improving HMIS and coordinate entry um, and really advancing equity and addressing disparities in the system in terms of who gets connected to the services available. So for each of these activities and investment opportunities, this is, um, this is a screenshot from, we wanted to share, we'll, again, we'll put this in the chat and we'll also send it around after, but we have developed, again, with the support of California Healthcare Foundation, um, a set of materials relating to CalAIM and HIP, and specifically diving much more further into detail on opportunities for collaboration that HIP offers. So we wanted to provide a little bit of a preview of this for folks who haven't seen it, and also kind of explain, because there's a lot of content in here, kind of the best ways to use it or what the intention was behind it. So you can see here at the top, um, activity investment opportunity. This is that first one that was on the list on the slide I just shared. So if we're looking at ways to improve and expand um, uh, methods to identify folks and outreach and engage with them and assess, assess them. Um, what we have here laid out is each of these areas has a bunch of different ideas of like very specific activities that can be worked on collaboratively, right? On the COC and homeless response side and the health plan. So we have it laid out here where on the left column that filled in color one. So for example, manage the annual point in time count and then um, coordinate for example, outreach programs, right? Those are the two ideas you can see here. So these are things on the, in this column that a COC or homeless response system generally um, possibly already is doing or you know, is in the right role to do if they had additional resources, right? So things that you all might be already doing or things that you might be wanting to do in order to um, improve your homeless response system if you had the right investment and funds and partnership. And then what we have in the second column here for each of these is multiple different ideas for potential ways that health plans in your community could contribute to those activities to, um, to improve the system overall and improve the access of, of care and resources to folks. And also then on the you know, final column, you can see to actually help to meet those metrics, right? So we had some questions earlier about um, health plans being concerned about not being able to hit these metrics. And we've seen, we've heard that as well in different communities. Um, and so this is really meant to help provide as much information to you all on the homeless response side um, as possible to approach these conversations and these kind of strategy, hopefully, you know, brainstorming and strategy sessions with your local health plans of, these are the things that we can do, like concrete ideas that we can do. These are things we're already doing. And here are some ways that you can fit in and integrate into our work in the places that we need most in our community in order to then affect these metrics that you need to meet in order to get this funding. So for each of these activity areas we have in these handouts, um, we list out the specific metrics that are most likely to be impacted. There's some color coding and some symbols that can, that'll identify hopefully at a glance, like which are those high priority metrics, those seven. And then also um, kind of recognizing that some metrics will be most more directly impacted than others by certain work. We kind of have laid that out as well. So again, this is meant to help. This won't all apply to every community. You all should be thinking about like where the particular most critical gaps are in your own homeless response. Um, and so these are kind of ideas to get you thinking. You can pull from them. Maybe they'll spur some additional ideas. But the focus here really is to provide some food for thought and some ideas for you to 
talk through and discuss with your health plans, um, either to actually include in the investment plan before it's submitted or to continue just kind of to work with them. Um, because even if a particular detail isn't included in the investment plan, as Julie said earlier, it's um, the health plans will continue to need to do work to meet their metrics in order to get the funds. And so all of these relate directly to that. So this next slide is just another, um, another kind of page in that handout that again, I think Julie's been sharing it in the chat and if not, we will, but the, oh, sorry y'all. <laughs> um, got a little excited y'all thinking about these resources. So this is just additional examples, right? But we just wanted to make clear that in these handouts that we'll share with you or in this handout, that's opportunities to engage. Um, each activity area that we, those five activity areas that we shared has one of these charts, the color coded chart that lays out again, the role of the potential role of the COC and then potential contributions of the health plan in order to impact the metrics that are laid out here. So with that, um, we have some time for, we have about 10 minutes for questions. I know we've been answering some along the way, but I will pause now and I think Frankie or Julie, one or both of you can, um, maybe lift up some questions that we might want to answer to everyone. Yeah. Um, just to stop and let you know, Jillian, while you've been chatting, we realize that the Q&A is not visible to anyone but the person who's asked the question, even in after we've answered. So the activity on the chat was mostly cutting and pasting those questions. So everybody should have those questions asked and answered in the chat. Um, and we will be following up and sending those asked and answered questions um, to you all. We will also be posting this on the website and we will also be um, sending it all to you all later, hopefully later today. Um, but a couple of big ones that folks wanted to ask. I think that one of the big ones is around data sharing and data sharing agreements. And <clears throat> if we go back to the metrics page, Jillian, if you can find the one, one of the metrics is entering into data sharing agreements with your local homeless system of care. I forget which one it is. <clears throat> um, it's number 1.4. Number 1.4. It's it's one of the seven priority metrics. I, I needed to see it read before I said <laughs> it because I was I thought it was a, a high priority. So as you can see, it's a high priority metric. So that means that they're gonna put a lot of uh the, you know, being able to accomplish that will be um beneficial to being able to draw down um, and meet some of those metrics. And the reason I wanted to pull it out now is um, on our website, um, one of the things Jillian talked about, we've been doing this work around healthcare homeless sector for a while. And um, we just came out with a guide this summer on how to share data. And um, in it, there's an entire chapter on data sharing agreements about how to put them together. And while it doesn't have a sample data sharing agreement, it does um, highlight two different communities who have approached data sharing agreements very different from each other, um, but that have, have had great success doing data sharing across healthcare and homeless systems. So I put um, that link in the chat. Um, it's on our healthcare. Uh, if you go to homebasecc.org, uh, we have a healthcare page and um, we've had we've had a series of webinars on data sharing, as well as the how to guide, um, which I think will be really helpful and worth looking at for um, for the effort to enter into data sharing agreements. Another question that someone had about that is, you know, what kind of data sharing um, can occur? And it really is going to be what you negotiate with your managed care plans between the managed care plans and the COCs. Um, of course, we would encourage bilateral data, bilateral data sharing um, so that not only um, the health plans can see how people are touching the health system, uh, the homeless system, but vice versa. You can locate people if they're in emergency or they're going through um, experiences that they're touching the health system and you want to make sure you know for continuity of care. So those are the kind of things that you all will want to negotiate when you're developing your data sharing agreements. Um, let's see what else was, I, I guess we can open it up um, before going back in other ones and pulling out other ones that um, I was going to say, Julie, we have a hand raised. So if we don't have another urgent question, yeah. someone submitted and maybe while we're, um, I can allow, I can take um, Brenda, you off mute if you want to share what either your question or your thought, and then 
anyone else who has additional questions, just keep putting them in a QA and we'll, we have a few more minutes. So, oh, I lost. Maybe that was an accident. Maybe Brenda didn't mean to raise her, <laughs> raise her hand. I got oh, it. Good. Oh, great. Oh, thanks, Frankie. Sorry. Go ahead, Brenda. Sorry, you guys. I didn't know when I unmuted, it stuck me back under the bottom. So anyway, thank you so much um, for this great presentation and a lot of um, wonderful information. Uh, not so much a question as just a thought. So, you know, I represent the Council on Criminal Justice and Behavioral Health. Um, but prior to that, I was I worked at DHCS in um, uh, mental health and substance use disorder services. So um, I saw everybody that's on the uh, call who wrote in where they're from. And so it just made me think of, uh, you know, this opportunity to lift up working with the behavioral health partners, like county behavioral health partners, but also uh, maybe county probation, even CDCR parole, um, and uh, you know, really trying to help that population with these funds. This is a great opportunity to really get in front of it. We at the council focus on reducing the prevalence of uh, individuals with um, behavioral health conditions who end up in jails and prisons. And, and we always talk about upstream, and this is as upstream as you could get really on um, being able to move some needle, you know, the needle on those prevalence rates. And so um, really having housing being foundational for people with uh, behavioral health, certain behavioral health conditions. So um, as folks are thinking about it, I would just encourage, um, you know, those ideas of reaching out again across when we talk about those collaborations, um, really bringing in multiple system partners. I know it makes it more complicated, but um, I think that the bang for the buck could be really big in the long run in terms of the, you know, the system collaboration and that infrastructure um, really, and it kind of sets everybody up in a great position for Calim um, in general. So just thanks for letting me make that comment. Um, for the justice involved, we have a report that we put out and how, you know, helping people with housing, um, which we can provide to you guys. I think maybe um, home-based team, you guys might have that already. If not, I'm happy to send that to you. Yeah, you can. Thanks, Brenda, so much for that comment. Really great point. And I think, I mean, there's lots of places where that could fit, for example, but just off the top of my head, right, if you're thinking about um, some of the priority metrics or some of the metrics include, you know, health plans being able to screen their members. And so as folks are getting connected to Medi-Cal, um, uh, you know, uh, upon reentry, especially and wanting to make sure they're screened for homelessness and connected to their plans and connected to ECM and CS, like all of those things interlap overlap really, really well. So Brendan, I'm glad you brought that up. And it's definitely something that, especially if you're aware in your community um, is a is a current gap, which I know it is in, in many places and it's, and you can link it to one or more of those metrics, it's much more likely to get some traction and, you know, kind of um, be included in either the investment plan or, or further along. You said it, Julia. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> Thank you. Another question that came in is folks said that they were thinking about creating a field in HMIS to capture if a person has Medi-Cal. Is that recommended? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you might even think about over time if they're receiving community supports or if they're receiving enhanced care management. So those are those are other areas. Um, and again, those might evolve over time as you all work together more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just as long as you're, I agree, everything Julie just said in response to that question. And also just as long as you're talking with your health plans as well, like A, letting them know if that capability exists. And again, a piece, one of the metrics is, um, connection to HMIS. And so health plans, if they don't already have access to HMIS, will be want will be requesting that to help meet that metric. And so if you're able to share like where we have this field where we can track if someone's enrolled in Medi-Cal, what their what their plan is is a really key piece, right? Like who's if you have more than one plan in your community, what their plan is. And to Julie's point, what services including ECM and particular community supports they've been enrolled in or are you know kind of in the process of getting enrolled with all of those are things that the plans we've been talking with in different communities are actively wanting to happen um, and so working with them to kind of figure out the best way to do that is really great. And I just wanted to jump in and say that um, we've been working with um, a community in California that's been um, working very closely uh, with the managed care plans. They have more than one managed care plan um, in the community. And the way that they have worked together on this is that they've had some conversations. Um, the COC put together uh, uh, kind of a dream wish list of where they think that would be the best place to leverage Medi-Cal managed care funds and resources to help them 
uh, meet some of these metrics as a group together. Um, and then the managed care plans um, together looked at um, that wish list and came up with um, what they knew their um, abilities were together to kind of um, develop their investment plan. And so that what that was a really deep collaboration where um, they got their wish list and they collaborated and they came up with something that is really going to fit fill some of the gaps and needs that HUD funding, HEAP and HAP and cash funding, other kind of funding that you all in California are getting don't necessarily meet and fill some of those gaps. Um, and so that was, again, a model for us in terms of um, the sooner you can in the next couple of weeks try to influence in those investment plans, but knowing that those aren't set in stone, um, even starting those conversations after those health, uh, those investment plans have been submitted and saying, hey, you know, we really, we need more money um, to do a pit count. <laughs> um, we don't have enough staff to do a pit count. We're a small local community and we're missing a lot. You know, could you help us hire a third party contractor? or we need help um, bringing a lawyer in to help us devise a data sharing agreement because we don't have access to lawyers to help us do that. So there's a lot of ways that you can ask the managed care plans for what you need and figuring out how to link that to the metrics so that of course we wanna help you all. We want a data sharing agreement. If you need help with a lawyer doing this because you are a small, one person staffed COC, of course we, you know, so having those conversations um, and figuring that out and letting the managed care plans know what your needs are and what those gaps are and how to fill them and then giving them the opportunity to say, yeah, this is something that we think will be so helpful to us that we can go ahead and um, do that. So anyway, it's just a, just a small example. I don't know if Jill, you have anything more to say. No, that's, that's a great point to end on too, I think. And I see we're, we have a minute left and just want to close out um, and don't have any open questions right now, which is great. So I, yeah, I think the, the health plans really need and want to know from you all on the COC side and the county side and the homeless response side, like what is most needed, like what it is that will have the biggest impact on these metrics, which again, are things that we all are collectively wanting to, to like make progress on. And so if you have the more concrete ideas you have, the more specific information you have about like what resources, how much of an investment is needed to make a big impact in you know all these different areas, that's exactly what they need from you and what they want from you and what they're trying to include in their investment plan. So in addition to what they want to invest internally, they also are really looking to you all as the experts in this work because you're doing the work um, and what needs to be done to meet these metrics. So. Um, as we wrap up, just want to say thank you so much for all of you for joining, for asking great questions. We'll send everything out around. We want to make sure you all are aware that these hand, these handouts um, that we've had up um, and additional resources are on that our health our healthcare website that we put the link on. These are this is different handouts. These this last this third and fourth house the HIP and the opportunities HIP. These are the handouts we've been we would encourage you all to look at, especially if you're planning to attend the office hours. If you haven't looked at those yet, if you take some time, that will be really helpful to bring you know, questions or th thoughts you want to share on the um, office hours. We've got a couple other resources um, we've here that we put in the chat and we'll send around. And again, just wanted to remind folks that we have this office hour available on Friday and then next Wednesday at a couple different times for folks. Some of you have already signed up. Frankie, thank you so much. Put the sign up form in the chat. So if you haven't signed up for one or both of these and want to attend to just come together, ask us the questions, ask each other questions, share ideas for what you want to talk to your managed care plans about. Um, that's, it's, you know, very free form, flexible time that we want to have available for y'all. So thank you all again so much. Really appreciate you all letting us talk through this with you. We're all really excited about this opportunity and hope you all feel a little more ready to talk to your health plans about it. So thanks all.